1798, explorer George Bass described Tasmania's west coast as presenting a rugged and determined front to the icy regions of the South Pole. The saw-toothed battlements of its craggy mountains run in unending line to the sea, interspersed with deep gorges and tree-matted gullies. Here the rivers, Arthur, Franklin, Nelson and Rapid, Lee, Norton, Savage and Pyman, and a host of tributaries, named and unnamed, pursue their endless quest for union with the Mother Sea. So the West remained, timeless, inviolate, until the 1870s, when the rivers became gateways for prospectors after the discovery of minerals in the forests and mountains. Driven on by a relentless urge for great wealth, the overlanders had to be tough to survive. In country virtually uninhabited and impossible for pack horses, the prospector had to carry everything he needed to live, tent, food and prospecting gear. On the Savage River, the brief rush petered out with some minor finds of alluvial gold and osmeridium. The prospectors ignored a vast deposit of magnetite ore, as the mining interest of that period centered around gold, copper, silver, lead and tin. The iron ore was too low grade, too impure and too inaccessible. So, for nearly a century, the iron ore was left untouched. Other Tasmanian West Coast mines boomed in the early years. Copper at Mount Lyle, zinc and lead at Rosebery and Williamsford, tin at Renison Bell, and they're still major mineral producers. For the others, only rusting remains left to the vagrant winds tell of their passing. For them, it was a brief, lusty burst of life and then extinction. Suddenly, in 1965, the Savage River came to life. Pickens Mather and Company of the United States of America entered the scene, experts in the mining and use of low-grade iron ore. Unlike the early miners who concentrated on taking wealth out of the mountains, they started to pour it back in again, to the extent of more than $70 million. With its head offices in Sydney, Pickens Mather and Company International negotiated a market with Japanese steel firms interested in Savage River iron ore. The project is located here at Savage River. The mining will take place there. We hope to develop a mine for about 45 million tons. That will be two and a quarter million tons a year. That will be transported through the pipeline uh, up to Port Lata. This is a, an offshore installation which uh, will go out to 50 feet of water. 
What is the length of the pipeline you contemplated? The pipeline coming to Port Latta is about 52 miles. And the size of the pipe would be? It's uh, nine inches. The project is in four main parts. One, at Savage River, a new township, open-cut mine, and a crushing and concentrating plant. Two, an ore slurry pipeline. Because of unsuitable harbors on the west coast, the pipeline was pushed 53 miles overland to the northwest seaboard. Three, at Port Latter, a plant was built to pelletize the ore concentrate pumped through the pipeline. And four, a loading facility for bulk ore ships to carry the pellets to Japan was built a mile offshore. Turning a winding bush track into an all-weather road became a task for the Public Works Department of the Tasmanian Government. This road was essential for the transportation of equipment to Savage River. In freezing, driving rain or hot, dust-laden air, the 25 miles of road was carved out of dense bush. Throughout the entire Savage River project, there was close liaison between the government and the company which developed the project. The Hydroelectric Commission built 50 miles of transmission towers and high tension line to give the project life. Components from overseas were shipped to the northwest coast port Burnie. Wherever possible, however, materials were purchased in Tasmania or interstate. The huge task began of transporting materials 75 miles overland to the mine site. the project took on a more recognizable form. Sixteen hundred workers molded and shaped the future and a mining complex grew in a wilderness. A former governor of Tasmania, Sir Charles Gardner, visited the site during initial stages of construction and saw the long hoped for iron industry reaching fruition. The pellet plant at Port Latter is situated in the Circular Head municipality, the first settlement on the northwest coast of Tasmania, discovered and named by explorers Bass and Flinders. Circular Head has an area of 2,000 square miles, much of it lush pastures for beef and dairy cattle and the production of root crops. This rich district is also renowned for its fine timber, a thriving tourist trade, and its ports cater for the fishing fleets which sail the Tasmanian coast. Rising like a giant from the sea, the pellet plant was designed to convert the high-grade iron ore concentrate into pellets. These are for blast furnace feed at five Japanese steel mills contracted to buy Savage Iron. Five vertical shaft furnaces were installed in the plant to bake the pellets hard to withstand repeated handling before, during, and after shipment to Japan. A loading facility to convey the pellets direct to the holds of the bulk ore carriers was built out into Bass Strait. Because of the size of the ships, 70,000 tonnes and more capacity, the loader had to be a mile offshore in deep water.
Jutting out into the sometimes stormy waters of Bass Strait, it's a mile-long bridge from the shore to a water depth of 50 feet at low tide. The mechanical loading equipment is located on concrete platforms, supported on steel piles, which rest on concrete foundations deep in the seabed. A wide range of floating equipment was used in the construction of the loader, including a 200-ton floating crane, Pacific Atlas, which was towed to Port Latter from San Francisco. Constructing the pipeline presented a major engineering problem. The 53-mile line twists its way from the mine to Port Latter. For most of its journey through rugged, uninhabited country, it travels underground, rising at several points to cross rivers and gorges to maintain its gradient. The nine-inch pipe carries a slurry of concentrated ore and water from the mine to the pellet plant. It's estimated to hold more than 5,000 tons at a time, 2,000 tons of this water. Perhaps the most hair-raising job on the entire project was building a 1,000-foot suspension bridge to carry the nine-inch pipeline 450 feet above the Savage Gorge. And at Savage River, an embryo township carved out of a wilderness. A town to accommodate up to 1,500 people. In January 1968, just two years from the first drilling of the ore body, Savage River mines were in production. The iron ore is taken from the open cut to a primary crusher where it's crushed to a manageable size. Many Tasmanians were trained in new technical skills to operate the industry. In the concentrator mill, 600 tonnes of ore an hour are ground with water in two autogenous mills till reduced to gravel size and then fed into magnetic separators for the first stage of magnetic separation. The first stage concentrate is then ground in two ball mills till reduced to the consistency of talcum powder. It's then pumped to magnetic separators for the final stage of magnetic separation, which removes the iron particles from the waste. 
The final concentrate in slurry form takes about 13 hours to travel the pipeline to Port Latter. On arrival at the northern seaboard, the water is filtered off. Balling drums roll the moist concentrate into marble size. A compound, bentonite, is used as a bonding agent in this process. From the drums, the pellets are baked in the furnaces and stockpiled. Stockpiled pellets are discharged from the offshore conveyor into the bulk ore carrier's holds at a rate of 2,750 tonnes an hour. Japan's newest and most modern steelmaking facility, the Yawata Iron and Steel Company's Sakai Works, near Osaka, unloads the bulk carriers at a rate of a thousand tons an hour. Pellets are carried by conveyor belt to a large stockpile, awaiting demand from the furnaces. Yawata has a high regard for savage iron used in its Sakai furnaces. The Savage River pellets are more uniform in quality than ores from many other sources, with an advantageously low silica content. In a world voracious for steel, steel for the advanced technology of a modern civilization, savage iron plays a vital role. The economy of Australia is further strengthened by the annual output of two and a half million tons of iron from the rugged far west of Tasmania. Savage River, a young town, but a permanent home for many in the heart of a mining complex. A town and a mine, both of which are nothing unless they have people to give them life and character. It's much the same as any small town anywhere, with all the amenities, modern shopping facilities, the school, churches, and for recreation and to attract tourists, a modern motor inn. A town on the gaunt profile of Western Tasmania. A monument to foresight and high endeavor.